he admits he has another great love of the arts, and that is music as well, and believes that his poems often draw upon musical styles and rhythms that he hears and, and includes in his poetry. His first book of poetry, Monsoon Blues, was published in 2011, and that is poetry based on his time spent in Vietnam during the war performing with a band for troops, where he played the clarinet. After he returned, Elijah admits that he had writer's block for quite a while and only started writing again at the age of 48. And that was with the help of a writer's group of veterans. And since then, he not only has gone on to write his own poetry and share it out throughout the country, but he has offered workshops for veterans through Poets and Writers Incorporated and Penn Center. He's a recipient of a number of fellowship awards, and he is also working as a social worker, and he has offered professional workshops for treatment of anxiety and panic with traditional breathing sounds and meditation. And what Elijah says about the importance of writing for him, uh, as well as what he's learned for all the people that he's worked with, is that writing has been very healing for me, especially when writing and sharing with a group of veterans founded by author Maxine Hong Kingston. I found that when difficult memories arise, they are now connected to love and caring for other veterans. And with that, I'd like to invite Elijah to come up and share his poetry with us. Please give him a warm hand. Also, I had stopped playing music for a really long time, and, uh, and then I, I got this inner message to that I won't feel complete unless I take up the clarinet again. And uh, so I wrote a poem. The first poem here I call Invocation. An invocation is when you invoke a being. And uh, so it's a, it's a really an I, I view it as an I-thou relationship or I-you relationship. So I'm going to um, improvise a little bit as I read the lines here each stanza here of invocation. Invocation. my mother said blessed me with a song of a robin through the window at my birth. Who knows me as a ray sent forth, unique yet inseparable from the source of all light. Speak my real name when I close my lips. Come down in moonlight to a land deep in sound. Unite my right and left hands as they press the place on my chest where pain rises into rapture.
look through my eyes at a blossoming dogwood. Give way to feet and slow my pace while I walk on the turning wheel of the world. Be near as the heartbeat that repeats your name in the surf of every breath. Raise my steps on the horizon between you and me. Help me fit the world's light into my eyes. Cut flowers. Suzette wanted me to grow a beard, burn my draft card, but after the third notice to report, I enlisted to be an army bandsman. On my flight to Vietnam, I carried pieces of a postcard, Van Gogh's sunflowers in my pocket, drenched in her perfume. Before she hacked her long black hair after mine was buzzed, she mailed the cut flowers with a note. I'll follow you to Canada, but not to war. I remember you barefoot for Suzette. My jungle boots are dusted red ochre, like the ash of blood spread everywhere. Ordered to police the area, I bend over a makeshift latrine to pick up pea-soaked cigarette butts with my bare hands while a sergeant bellows at me as he zips up. My cold is drying out and the thermometer reads 130 degrees in the shade. I've lost you. There are holes where your eyes should be. I fleck them green, find freckles, reinvent your face fevered from memory, your coarse black hair so long you could walk on it. I imagine you dancing while I sip warm beer and eat pizza, melting into pools of cheese with floating shrimp. You dance while a sergeant shouts, don't turn on the fan, the wind will burn you. You, barefoot, sculpting the passage of clouds to a Joni Mitchell tune. If I had surrendered to you instead of to the army, if we'd fled to Canada instead of to our fears. I'm watching you now because I need to hold on to you for a while longer, even if your dancing figure is all I have. This is called Silver Skates. <clears throat> Sometimes we had uh, people visit us who were, were extraordinary musicians, but they still had to do their time in the Army or in the Navy. And this, is, this person was a, a pretty respected oboist. Silver Skates. Aloof without a smile or only a half smile. Not an invitation to approach, although he wasn't shy. His lanky fingers curled around his oboe keys too long for them, yet he made them fit. We were children compared to him, tall and dark, well-dressed even in fatigues, as if he were in a tux with the Chicago Symphony. Or was it the New York Phil where he got his break? There were 17 army bands in Nam who waited the way we had to for this virtuoso on his tour. And when the time was right, he spoke to us, filling our hall with his heart cane cut from a hollow stalk, full-throated in its tone, even and clear like a silver thread running through Foray's Apre en Reve and Hansen's Pastorelle, passages from Prokofiev and Hindemith, 
We had forgotten how to listen, not just woodwinds, but all the brass and drums. Strange to schedule his schedule, strange to schedule his recital with the war at our gate, crazy to play in a band while men were dying nearby. Besides, our concerts would be postponed, yet we would rehearse. We called him Silver Skates because he skated out of guard duty in KP. But in the end, it was right he left, so others could hear that tone in large, con dolore, con fuoco, and tranquillamente, from pain and fire to, to tranquility. Okay. Um, when I was over there, Congress decided to um, stop the ground war. <laughs> and yet a friend of mine had been in, in quite heavy combat for, for months. He eventually got into the band, but, uh, and we became really close friends. And uh, we, uh, <laughs> we did many th wonderful things together. And, uh, and we were both spiritual in our own way. I'm looking for the one I want to read though right now. I'm going to um, read this one. Um, this is important to me, this particular poem, because so many uh, things happened when you discovered in the face of the enemy another yourself. In other words, you, you, things were similar that would remind you and you had to, 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 to see that and to live through that. So. They, over there, his name was Birdsall, and they called him Bird. Bird grieves for the man they killed. We wore the steel bracelets of Montignards, money for that mountain people, good fortune for us. I held my broken glasses together with safety pins. I wrote the 23rd Psalm on my helmet's elastic band. John Jim, our ammo bearer, gave us each a Navajo necklace, turquoise and onyx, with a single white feather strung by his wife. I took out earphones every night and listened to George Harrison sing My Sweet Lord. If only we had not found a picture of wife or girlfriend in the billfold of the Vietnamese we killed. Easy to say it wasn't me who shot him, but I still see his eyes that never closed and should accuse me, yet don't. They're looking at her photo. And here's a, another thing that in some ways is similar. We were sent off to uh, give concerts and um, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, many different things. And um, so this is called uh, Stepping Across. And we were at a military religious retreat center near Cameron Bay. It's by, by the ocean there. And uh, this is called Stepping Across. Never before have I looked upon a place of worship as an edifice of war meant to ease us into the old blood sacrifice. I have this flashlight. Can't stop seeing this dead boy's face, Bird whispers. I wrote it, rotated to the rear when Cherry Boy from Nebraska bumped into a Viet Cong in the dark canopy, stumbled and shot, then kept moving what he's supposed to do. He left the enemy behind, a step on, just a boy too, his eyes blank, rain on his face. The first kill you see, that's the worst. Sitting on a hard bench, looking at stained glass, I thread its light through both of us. We leave our sacrifices on the altar's marble slab. Outside, women line up along a one-foot fence or stand in doorways and windows with slit-skirted legs. A breeze rises our rib cages. Bird winks at me, then steps across. Um, I'm going to read this one called Both Sides. In my reconstituted mashed potatoes, I found a dead fly. Which side of the ocean is it from? If I chew too long on a stick of gum, Trade cigarettes for watermelon. Suck on a rind when the sweetness is gone. Groom a couple of mangy dogs. 
or listen to a Joni Mitchell tape while I pray in a boarded up chapel for both sides now. It's because my sweat has made a covenant with this red dust, turning it into clay. If rain falls on me or I shower, the memory color embedded in my pores won't wash out. I am grafted to the skin of this land and its blood. A year ago, while I low crawled through sand at Fort Dix, my captain caught me smiling and threatened for the second time to shoot me in the back if we met in Nam. It was the final letter from Suzette that brought the smile, the longing I felt in her words. Spring, wild, crazy birds traveling in high diagonals. My partner is gone and I do not know how to dance alone. Now war dog is panting. Our breathing circulates through every horizon I've seen, from New York to Quang Tri. Yesterday was limitless blue. Today, restless clouds. Homesick, I tend wounds and get down with the dog. This is called Even Bullets Have Faces. I see how from moment to moment, the face of a cloud is never the same, and how before leaves turn brown, their veins resemble those in my hands. I feel how my beard that was soft three years ago has grown rough, and how a mole that was a speck in the small of my back embarrasses me now when I shower or cinch my belt. I see my face in the face of an ant or a flying cockroach or the horse that sneezed from the dust of a parade, and I hear myself talk like a trained parrot that's looking at me with eyes the color of mine. The branches of the pines that I climbed in Kingswell Woods were arms that held me before they were cut down, before the nearby creek became a street, and my young life was paved over. The hard bench I sit on, meant to help me pray, has become the seat of my anger, and it's difficult to grope for truth with a clenched fist. I examine freckles on the back of my hand and liken them to the ones on McKittrick's face. He's sitting next to me, but I don't dare say what I'd like to say to him. The night has entered the husk of his body at high noon. Even bullets have faces, but their mouths do not open until they strike their targets. His chipped elbow, his right arm, wounds are warning me to watch out for my hands and feet, warning me that I must give up my face because it has already changed. It is no longer me, as when stubborn roots break down the face of a rock, opening its silent mouth. And this is called, um, these guys all asked me to lead them in meditation, because I did yoga on the, on the line. This is called what we were looking for. We pried the door of an empty roadside chapel with windows boarded up. I liked how neglected it was, how simple, an abandoned afterthought, like how I viewed myself, not important enough to be labeled a rune. But they chose me to lead us, perhaps because I did yoga, even on guard duty, getting high and breathing. We lit candles and sat in a circle. Lewis settled in, his eyes smiling. Gaddy sang gospel to warm things up. McKittrick prayed the way he blew his trombone, cheeks turning red. We sent a field of energy in all directions, like Bird did with his squad, hoping that we would never kill or be killed. We pictured clouds of light, sun gold or roseate, green for life, blue for the freedom of sky, wrapped ourselves in our loved ones, than those we disliked, also the Vietnamese who wanted us gone, especially them. Anyone can join, soldiers from either side, Jesus and Buddha, of course, Einstein, Martin Luther King, Ho Chi Minh. We got lucky, five guys walking a dirt road at Camp Eagle, Vietnam. Now, <clears throat> I'm in the process of writing an opera with a friend of mine who's a, a composer. I'm creating the words. I'm, and, and what's significant about this is that in real life, my friend Bird, um, there was a firefight and all kinds of people died and so forth. And he was doodling and uh, numerology, and, and, but he didn't know what it meant. And some guy came up to him and said, well, do mine. And then he looked at the person and he realized, I have to give this person hope. And it turned out that <clears throat> 120 people came to hear him speak from his heart to give them hope. So I'm gonna read one thing from here. Um, one of the people here. Um, okay, this one I call it Seeker. 
and this would be probably set to song later. Don't shush me with your eyes when I sing to the dead. Why not speak of these things? Here there is no horizon except what we slash from triple canopy. Why hopeful mornings can seem impossible. Yet I feel this yearning and I can't stop halfway to find the truth along this trail of snakes. Kingsley, your birth path is seven, a deep thinker. Your name number is one, a natural leader, a wounded truth seeker, even if you stand alone. Don't shush me with your eyes when I sing to the dead. Carry me to a nameless white cloud. Carry us, the living and the dead, away from a trail where there is no mercy. Carry me away from where I forget to listen tenderly to the parting of leaves. Kingsley, where thoughts become leaves, arms and legs branches without roots, it's easy to merge into fine rain drifting south from a mountain. But here there is no open gate, no yard or porch yet small birds sing. Seeker, don't shush me with your eyes when I sing to the dead in the orange dusted haze of the waning moon. From the warm stone where I sit, it's too dark to see the blue in your iris. There's lunar shrapnel in my hip. Crazy to think it. I laugh and cry. I laugh and cry. Thank you. between us for Elijah, who enlisted to play in the Army Band after three draft notices, hoping to avoid Vietnam. No matter how many stories you tell, how many poems you write about Vietnam, the boys who became lost soldiers crawling through jungles, returning from the bush with that wild and empty look, surprised to be alive, who found comfort in music and heroin, pure cut, about the mama sons dutifully emptying barrels of GI, teenage prostitutes, farm girls really, and the line of GIs, about bunkers built on graves, ghosts rising in rice paddies beyond, endless guard duty patrolling the perimeter with a semi-automatic and too tight boots, listening for any sound in the wire. The silence of an ammo dump with enough TNT to blow a small village. About a boy crossing a swamp on a water buffalo. War dog who guarded you, who never barked. The comfort of his growl, his silent pant as you searched the northern sky to find home. No matter how many times you describe the starkness of the land after a bomb, the 130 degree heat that tugged at your skin, the relentless monsoon as if you were trying to wash the war away, the absurdity of soldiers as bandsmen preparing for a concert that would never be played, marching through potholes, transported in a giant helicopter with a hatch that severed a leg once, helicopters that could be shot down every single time. No matter how many words you use to evoke those images, I can only listen as your tongue rolls out each syllable, forming landscapes where a young soldier harnessed to a rifle and a clarinet steps deliberately, searching for a reason he was yanked out of school, then returned to a place where life somehow continued, where no one, nothing waited, as if that boy would never return. And he never really did. Thank you. He was conflicted. He was torn. Torn between right and wrong, duty and honor, God and country. Raised with love thy brother and do unto others and turn the other cheek. And now he stood with a weapon. It wasn't a war, it was a conflict. A conflict centered on saving the people, giving them a future of hope and peace and prosperity. He knew the cause was just. Just what? Justified? So much was destroyed and so many were caught in the way, but the oppressors were vanquished, 
the weak given voice, the towns made safe. Or so he was told. And he took comfort in that when he thought of what had been done. It happened in a flash and a boom and a dull thud before his body showed mercy and shut down the pain. Massively damaged yet numb, he was conflicted. He was torn, torn asunder, torn limb from limb and briefly torn between heaven and earth. But it was not his time to go. Though they feared he'd been lost, he found his way back, guided by miracles of medicine developed on the battlefield. They'll save lives back home, or so he was told. And he took comfort in that when he thought of the friends who didn't return. The new leg was amazing, light, and strong, and futuristic, and he was grateful to have it. But he mourned for his lost limb. He was conflicted. He was torn. The conflict created such a need that the funding was no problem to create such a wonder of engineering. And nothing was too good for those who had given so much. It will help everyone. Or so he was told. And he took comfort in that. When he thought of what had been given and what had been lost, he was shattered. He was restored. He was changed. He was conflicted. Thank you. tree.